so we're turning our attention to Esther now. This is a book of the Bible. It's a historical book of the Bible. And what we're going to do is we're going to unpack it in a little bit different way. What we're going to do in this is we're going to go character by character. Instead of being like verse one, chap- chapter 1, verse 1 and going through, we're going to really unpack the characters somewhat chronologically. But they're woven through the story. And today, as you um, saw the crown coming off of Vashti's head, today we turn ourselves towards the character, the person Vashti. Now, if I said that name, you'd be like, I I don't know who that is. Most of us don't know who the the biblical character Vashti is, but Vashti was queen to King Xerxes. This really, really matters that we understand. A lot of people are like, is is the Bible history? What what is the Bible? I want to say something. Scripture speaks a narrative and understands its historical place throughout time because you see things like this. King Xerxes is known throughout the world. Like, who here saw the movie 300? Anybody? So you're my kind of people, right? right? You just hack them and chop them. It's great. All right. So um, 300, King Xerxes is the army at Thermopylae who goes up against the Spartans. That's Xerxes. And Xerxes ruled from India clear to Kush. So clear up into Turkey and different things. So his empire spanned 127 provinces, and she was queen to King Xerxes. King Xerxes is the one who fought the Greco, Greco um, Persian Wars, and it was just a phenomenal historical span, okay? And this book takes place right around um, the same time as Nehemiah, maybe around four 450, 460, so it's right in that range. And Vashti was the queen to King Xerxes. She was Persia's leading lady. Here's what we need to know about Vashti. King Xerxes didn't understand what second best was. Vashti would have been the most beautiful, the most talented, the most confident, whatever great adjective you can put towards a lady, she would have been it. She would have come from one of the 127 provinces, and she would have held the eye of the most powerful man on the earth. So she was beautiful. She was a great party host, but her Achilles heel is that she believes she's more than all these things that are listed above her. She believes she's more than just a queen, a leading lady, an incredible hostess, and these different things. She believes that she is so much more, and she's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up in a reading of Esther chapter 1. Ironically, I said we wouldn't do that, but we're doing it today. Um, Chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to read from this, and then we're going to stop and talk about it. So here's what we got. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. At the time of King Xerxes' uh, reign, he reigned uh, from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all the nobles, the military leaders, that's important, of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the province were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor of his glory and majesty. A 180-day banquet. Yes, please. Like, I mean, you're like, let me check my calendar if I have half a year, Right? This seems normal to you. First of all, you didn't invite me to your 180-day banquet, and I'm hurt. All right, um, so 180 days. When these days were over, that wasn't enough, so the king gave a banquet lasting seven more days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace. For all of the people, um, from the least to the greatest, who were in the citadel of Susa, the garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material, And uh, to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold, um, costly stone on mosaic pavement, silver rings on marble pillars, couches of gold and uh, silver, oh my gosh, I'm getting lost, and costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold. Think of that. Goblets of gold. Red Solo cups he had not, right? This is Xerxes, like think of it. Goblets of gold. Each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. This is terrible. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in her royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, 
When Queen, King Xerxes was high in spirits from the wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, we're skipping their name, down to verse 11, to bring before him Vashti, Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the, uh, to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. We are terrible at sanitizing scripture, right? We see it as like, bring forth my bride, whom for thus thou might be looked upon because she is lovely of eye, right? No, no. Seven days he's been drinking. So it's more like, you want to see how high my wife is? She's so high. Number one, get her. And off he goes to find his wife. The dude's hammered. He's been drinking for seven days, and before that, he had a 180-day warm-up. His hammies are loose, his liver is shot, and he's going at it. And he's like, we're going to see how hot she is today because she's my queen. Like, he's so hammered. The dude is drunk. As a wife. <laughs> yeah, not, not as a wife. I'm not a wife, but uh, I mean, anywho. God. Um, grammar gets me every time. Um, so as a wife, how would Vashti, can she's just like, Look at him. He's got, like, stuff in his beard. Super hammering, like, yeah, no, no. No, I'm not going to go in there and let him look at me. Like, what would you think? What? what? <laughs> I can only imagine. Erica, no, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> like, yeah, you just laugh. You're like, hey, check it out. I can punt a pastor. Like, that would not happen, right? That's just, oh, he's hammered. And now it's time to show off his prized possession. For him, unfortunately, his prized possession was a person. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. The king became furious and burned with anger, which means I think he just fell asleep in his chair. He's like, oops, and he's out. All right. Um, since it was custom customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and uh, were closest to the king. Jump through the names here. Um, these seven nobles of Persian media had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs had taken to her. Then Mimukhan also replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong. She has done wrong, but not just against you, King Xerxes. She has done wrong against all of the nobles. See? The king, but against all the nobles. Because who's been drinking at the party all week? Let's keep reading. At the people, and the peoples of the province of King Xerxes, for the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the king's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. So what we see here, and just real quick before we go on, is they're like, my wife's going to smack me upside the head for being gone for 187 days drinking at deer camp. Can you fix this? That's really, I mean, they're saying, look, we're going to get it too if you don't do something. There will be no end to the disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, because it would really please us, um, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Today, I want to talk to you about being more than a pretty face. We're in a culture that soaks up images like you just can't imagine. We've talked about it before, but we're going to talk today about a woman who had enough dignity and character to stand up and say, enough. And today we're going to stand up and say, enough, and be more than just a pretty face. Have you ever heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Anybody ever heard that? The question for Christians becomes, then what are we beholden to? What are we seeking to be seen by? And if we're just really honest, anyone who will look, anyone who will follow, anyone who will troll and kind of seek us out, we're willing to be looked at. So we recognize that in our lives, there is this reality that we are more than a pretty face. We know this intrinsically as Christians, but we have this worth that is nestled into the world's ethic, the cultural ethic. 
And we see in Queen Vashti that there's this painful reality where she's not willing to be just another pretty face. And she takes a costly stand, but she does so in a way that God will use to raise up another in her place, but also to give to her, I think, an identity far better than being another pretty face, because pretty faces fade. What's your worth in the world's eyes? See, there's this thing, and I do not encourage you to do it. We were in staff meeting. I asked Erica and a a gal who works on graphics to type in hashtag hot on Twitter. And Danielle typed it in, and then she's like, oh, they're all guys at the gym. Like, you know, with that kind of vacant look on their face. Am I hot? No, you're swole up, but you're not hot. You're kind of a doorknob because you just put that on, on, like, online for people to see what? How jacked you are. How big you are. It was mostly guys, but there's a ton of, apparently, a ton of women trying to be what? Hot. Hot. Apparently, just, just oh, it's you know, so good looking. Right? I just so, so good looking. That's what we want to be. In the world's eyes, we want to be beautiful. But the reality is that we are more. These are the words spoken of Queen Vashti before she was deposed. It said this, bring before the king, Queen Vashti, wearing her royal clown, I say clown again, I'm gonna shout. All right, royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. And the question comes, is there more to Vashti? Those are the words of Xerxes. Bring her out, I just wanna look. I don't want to really know. I don't want to connect. I just want to look. And in the world's eyes, in the world's eyes, our worth is rooted in statements like that. What are you worth? What are you worth? 50 years from now, how hot will you be? Will it be like, you know, there's not a sizzle to that. You just like, you know, it just, I mean, honestly, last night was my 25th reunion in San Diego, California. I didn't go because I don't want them to see what time is done. And um, I saw some pictures and I was like, yes, it did it to them too. So you look at it and you go, you know, we, we're not what we once were. You know, we're not, gravity is taking its toll on all of us. And in 50 years, if you're still hot, you need to see a doctor, right? That is not... It, it, Are we more than what we appear to be? See, we get into this weird game in our society. If I can't be the prettiest, I'll be the smartest. If I can't be the smartest, I'll be the nicest. If I can't be the nicest, I'll be whatever. Guys, sometimes, and this, I mean, it goes both ways, but guys, like, if I'm not not the best looking, I'll be the strongest. If I'm not the strongest, I'll be the fastest. If I'm not the fastest, then I'll be the funniest because I'll mock the people while they're running and then hope they don't catch me. Like, that's, you want to be something. You want to be on top. You want worth, and you have this desire that is an idolatry of self-worship and self-focus. And it is time for the church to get our eyes off ourself and look to the one in whose image we are to be transformed. We have to get our eyes up because there's this world's worth and then there's this worth in Christ. When we look at our worth in Christ and we look and see who we are, listen to the words of Jesus. This is Jesus talking about you and I are not five sparrows like little birds sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. So God doesn't even forget the sparrows. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than sparrows. And I'll be honest, we give ourselves away to the opinion of the world for a lot less than two pennies. We give ourselves away to anyone who will consume. But our worth in Jesus Christ is trying to communicate to us that there is an intrinsic value in who we are and an intrinsic value in who we are called to be in Christ that is transformative. It's transformative. Pretty people, talented people, fast people, smart people, dime a dozen. If you think you're super smart, go to Caltech and find out your average, right? If you're a super great athlete, Go to Michigan, go to one of their football camps and find out what it feels like to be the other guy. Like there are bigger, faster, stronger people always. All these things are dime a dozen when we want to be looked at. Anybody can be looked at. What matters? What makes us different? And here's the question that we must ask, and Vashti points to it. Are you willing to do what she did 
to grab onto your true identity. You have a better identity than the one in this world. Could you do what Vashti did? So let's spin it into modern cultural context. Um, anybody here watch the Academy Awards? Oh, like three of us. Well, they're terrible, so you shouldn't. No, I'm joking. Um, all right, you guys are going to break my heart here. Anybody here watch the Country Music Awards? Oh, there's a prayer meeting in my office right after this. Please join me with your red solo cup and terrible boots and shorts. All right, um, I'm just joking. All right, so there's award shows, right? And, and we, we may not get it living in the Midwest, but um, in, the, in the circles of fame and fortune and all these things, this is a big deal. You don't think fame and stuff is a big deal, just fame, talentless fame, Kim Kardashian. Um, so let's just do that for a minute. Kim and Kanye's wedding was $12 million. The venue was four hundred grand to rent. Her cake was $7,000. Xerxes, anyone? Right? It's a huge thing to do what? Look at me, look at me, look at me. Take me in. Just value me, right? But there's this other upper echelon of talented actors and actresses who are valued by the SAG and the Academy. Let's just think for a minute that you're the up and coming face. You waited tables in LA for a couple of years, which a lot of talented people do, and you find yourself on the cover of a few magazines. You're the next face up and coming in Hollywood. You've got this bright, energetic way about you and Hollywood's really fallen in love with its new it person. And you have, a, have an agent who comes in and smelling like smoke and stale effort comes in and says, I got a script you're not gonna believe. And they hand and say, this script is unbelievable. It's already getting the attention of the Academy. That Oscar statue that you so covet, that is in these pages. And the, the, the supporting cast is Tom Hanks and, I mean, honestly, the goddess of Hollywood, Meryl Streep is your supporting actress. You are golden. Just take this script and make the most of it. It's made for you. They want you. Oh, and by the way, the they is Ron Howard and Martin Scorsese, the eyebrows. That's who wants you. You're, oh my goodness, you're set. You're a legend. Just take the script and you look at the script and it defames God and it rips God and the faith to shreds and it's got a bunch of sexual immorality and you go, I can't do it. And you push it back and instead of being Hollywood's it person, you become their byword. And they rip you to shreds in the media, in the, in the social media sections and they destroy you. They just rip you to shreds. That's what happened to Vashti. She was queen. She was number one. And by the time they got done with her, she was a crownless peasant walking off into nothingness because she was worth more than just being looked at. Would you be willing to pay that price? See, here's the problem. We, we don't recognize how temporary the crowns are we earn. We don't recognize how quickly our crowns go away. Someone will be faster than you if you're quick. Don't worry, it won't be me. We'll still be friends, but someone will. Someone will be stronger. Someone will be more beautiful. Someone will sing better. Someone will act better. Someone will be a better teacher. Someone will be a better doctor. Someone will be a better pastor. Someone will outdo you, and your crown will be taken away from you, and who are you then? Who are you then? Are you a desperate person struggling to hang on? I want to show you what it looks like, but I need your help, okay? And I promise I won't do anything weird. Just close your eyes for me. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a visual. Close your eyes. Trust me. Trust Eric. All right? Like Kava Sly Python. Trust in me. Okay. All right. Keep them closed for a second. We had to call wardrobe for this. Don't look. Be patient. All right. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Who's the boss? This is my high school letterman's jacket. Folgers, written in cursive. I can turn it this way as well. It's awesome. I walked through the hallways of Helix High School with my letterman's jacket, and I was the boss, right? You're just walking through, you're like, uh, whose hallway? Mine. Why? Because I earned the letter. Black sleeves, class of 92, 25 years, I'm getting old. But still, here's the deal. That's cool in 1991, 1992. What if I went in wearing this temporary crown today? They'd be like, where's that dude's white van and free puppies, right? <laughs> All right, do you get it? Temporary crowns. I put this thing on and I'm like, okay. You know, like I, this thing used to be so baggy and long. It's 
not. Why? It's a temporary crown. I was the boss. Girls, this happens to you because, I don't know, guys are creepy. But um, have you ever been at a, a gathering in high school? And West 97 shows up in his letterman's jacket. We were state champs. You're a doorknob. And you need to stop wearing your high school letterman jacket three years after you graduate. It's no longer impressive. It's a temporary crown. How many of these do we have in our life? How many temporary crowns do we hold on to and say, give me worth, give me value? And people are like, it makes you a joke. It makes you a joke. It turns you into a laughing punchline. So what we have to do is recognize that we can't walk around with the temporary crowns of this world and think we're going to find some sort of permanent value. We have to be people who reject temporary crowns because they're fleeting. So what do we grab onto? You're like, Eric, if you can't have a letterman's jacket, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's good for its season, but it's temporary. It's temporary. Your physique is temporary. Your position at your, at your job is temporary. We are temporary. Last time I checked, the mortality rate in this room is 100%. We might want to start playing for the long game. We might want to find what truly defines us. Here is what we find. In the words of the Apostle Paul, we find, we find an eternal crown, a crown that never vanishes. Paul says this, everyone who competes in the games, he's speaking Olympics, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that won't last. And back then it was a woven, like, um, botanical crown. The crown doesn't last. But we, we Christians who live a strict and disciplined life, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul. And we need to recognize Far too often, we as Christians have traded our identity in Jesus Christ that is eternal and unchanging, and it is won by Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and then I believe the most poignant statement of our worth to God is not only in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but after Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected, what did he do? He took all that he won And he handed it to a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors, and he said, I'm leaving you to tell the world about me. I trust you. This is really good news. You are more valuable than you could ever imagine, and this world doesn't have a crown that deserves your head because the crown you are given in Christ is the crown of eternal life. It is the crown of son and daughtership to the high king who's not just here to look at you. God is not just watching us from a distance. He is deeply interactive in our lives. So we hold to a crown that lasts forever, bought by the blood of Christ on the cross, won by his resurrection and empowering us to be the kingdom of God manifest in this world. And we trade it quite often for 50 likes and a few new followers. It's got to feel like it just lets the wind out of God's sail, doesn't it? When he loved us so much that he would give us a crown that lasts forever by his blood. So here's the question. How do we apply this to our everyday life? How do we take this and make it live in our daily lives? So first thing I want to do is ask you to be courageous enough to believe in God's definition of your worth. That is devastatingly difficult. So let's just unpack it from... Let's do it from my perspective, okay? I'll do it for me, and then you can be like, okay, I'm trying to interpret it into yours. The foundry in Zealand right now, everybody's kind of talking about it. What's that little foundry church thing? And they, they want to know, and they, they come and they check it out maybe, but they talk about it. A lot of pastors don't really care for me. I don't like that guy from the foundry. I'm like, you don't even know him. He's magical. But that's a different story. Like, he, I think I'm great. But... <laughs> But you're out there and you're, you, you've got this buzz and people are like, man, it's really growing. Like they had 20 people a few years ago. It's like 1,000 people in the church. Wow, they're doing something right. Foundry, like everybody kind of gets on board, right? Let's just jump ahead 15 years. What if I'm wearing the Foundry Letterman's jacket? Yeah, when we were new, we really grew quick. That was awesome. What have you done since? No, my actually just grew real quick when I was young. 
What, what, if, what if we continue doing exactly what we should? We plant churches and we never, as, a, as this body, we never really grow a ton more, but we plant new churches around the community and our influence doesn't grow, but other pastors are reaching other people. And not only that, maybe one of our own offspring churches are growing like gangbusters and they are just doing crazy and people are talking about them and ignoring us. Am I any less valuable in God's eyes? Are you? No. We are still participant in God's work here and now. The fact is we have deceived ourselves to think that it was all about us when it's always been about him. It's always been about him. And we have to be courageous enough to believe in God's definition of our worth, not this world's. Because the world's definition of your worth is very temporary and they like to take away your crown and then beat you with it. They're just cruel. The world is tough on people. There's trolls who circle the internet looking for people to mock and just destroy. Why? Because, I don't know, maybe they're lonely in their parents' basement, but they're just going after people, and it's brutal, and you're like, why would you do that? Because the world delights in temporary crowns. The gospel is rooted in eternal crowns that bring us the gift of eternal life, and it starts presently now. What will we do with that? So in your world, in the world you live in, how do you live with that? What happens when you're not the it person at work? You're not the young up-and-comer. What happens when you're not the young mom with the little kids and, and that was your identity? What happens when you're not everything you thought you were? Well, in Christ, you've always been the same thing, a Christian who is purposeful for the purposes of God's kingdom coming to rest in this world and being active in this world. The second thing is this. You need to ask the question, what can I start doing? I know a lady who um, taped to her to her mirror on um, on her bathroom mirror. It was uh, scripture out of oh, I think it was First Peter, and it was um, beauty does not come from outward adornment. It doesn't come from outward adornment. It comes from the heart. And every time she looked in the mirror to either tell herself she was fat, unlovely, perfect, wonderful ideal, whatever she looked in and saw, there was another thing staring back that said, you are not all that you appear to be. You are so much more. How many of us have fallen to the fatal flaw of thinking we are what we look like? We are how we perform. Let us not insult God that he needed pets. He wanted a relationship. He didn't want you to jump and dance and do a show for him. He wanted to live in relationship with you and transform you from your image into his. And I look at that scripture on the mirror where someone walks in and sees that scripture on the mirror and remembers they are not all they appear to be. No matter how beautiful or imperfect they are, it doesn't matter what you see. It matters who you are in Christ. So I want to encourage you in one thing. Robert F. Kennedy said this. Those who fail, or those who are so afraid of failure that they never risk failing greatly, will never succeed greatly in anything. And the greatest thing you could be is a person growing into the image of Jesus Christ. That is your chief and purpose end and goal, is to look more like Christ when you leave this world. To look more like the one whom we love. Abraham Lincoln, in his memoirs, had a moment in the world in the Civil War where he went into a church during a midweek service and he sat down in the back kind of area right by the pastor's study to hear the word of God preached and hopefully bring solace to his soul as the country was tearing itself apart. He sat and listened to a Methodist preacher or a Presbyterian preacher just lay the word of God down. It was great and it was transformational or it was great and it was, it was kind of powerful as the word of God spoken. As they left, the pastor saw the presidents in the room and he wondered what the president thought of his words. And the president was nice. He said it was concise. It was well-spoken, da-da-da-da. But the, the pastor wanted to know, was it good? And he said, this is where you failed in your, pre, in your preaching. You failed to ask something great of us. And we need to be greater. I want to ask something great of you today. Become like your Lord and Savior. Become more like Christ. Don't be owned by the eyes that just want to look at you but never know you. Be owned by the one who fixed his gaze on you, stretched out his arms and died that he may know you. Become like the one who 
who called you by his name. My friends, if you are a Christian, your highest calling has just been presented to you. Become like him, that the world may see and know who we love and who has also redeemed them. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we falter so often to the, to the critical voice of this world, to the definition of beauty, to the definition of talent. Lord, we love to chase temporary crowns and we get lost in the process. So since our beauty does not come from outward appearance, we ask God, would you show us what's on the inside of us? Would you show us that we are the very temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are your people and that you are transforming us from the brokenness of this life into the realities and the challenge of the life to come. And Lord, it starts presently. So we ask, come Lord Jesus, speak a word to us that gives value into our soul and remind us of who we are in you and mute the voice of this world that tells us all the ways we have failed to measure up. Lord, I pray that you would take the temporary crowns of this world and do exactly as Xerxes said, that you would remove it from our heads and that we would never be before them anymore, but our eyes would be before you and that you would fit onto us the crown of life that causes the kingdom of God to come here and now that the world may see and know that you, Lord Jesus Christ, are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We pray this in your name. Amen. Friends, please stand. Sing with me. Friends, the world will turn away. The world will turn away from you. They will turn away and remind you of all your failures. And even the crowns we have, a la Letterman's jacket, doesn't tell the story that it's because I was a second string varsity player. You may think, oh, he was awesome. Yeah, not so much. Even my crowns are pretty thin. Let's be honest. The world will turn away. Every time it will fail you. But there is this thing that happened the day that Jesus was crucified that we should never forget. The Father turned his face away from Jesus Christ at one point in all of history. And Jesus Christ cried out the words of the psalmist, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is simple. Because Jesus Christ bore all the sin, all the shame, and all your failure so that God would never have to turn his face away from you. Again, God does not turn away from those he loves. He does not turn away from those who bear his name. So my question for you is this. If you are a Christian, will you go live as one, please? I invite you to dig into Mark chapter 1 this week and Esther chapter 1 and 2. Mark chapter 1 because you'll find out the gospel's full of ordinary like people just like us. And Esther 1 and 2, because I want you to be familiar with this story and in the Word of God. And for those of you who are in this room and you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to meet the one who will never look away. He will never turn his face away. He did it once to Christ on the cross. And that was it. It is finished. For you and I, we are invited to relationship with him. If you don't know Jesus Christ, the invitation is yours. Come down afterwards. I would love to pray with you and introduce to you to him who loved us first. As we go about this Christian life together, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. May the peace of Christ be yours in this chaotic world of temporary crowns. May the peace of Christ be worn on your head as your crown of eternal life. The church must leave the building. You're dismissed.